We may live over 5,000 miles from Lincoln Financial Field, but what we lack in proximity, we make up for in the film study. And each and every week, we will be bringing you in-depth film breakdowns from across the pond and the Sooner State. Welcome to On the Shane Page. I am your host, Shane Half. You can follow me on Twitter at Shane Half NFL. And I'm joined by BGN's own Johnny Page. Give him a follow at Johnny Page 9. Johnny, how are you doing this evening? I am well. I'm going to start with a little uh, two weird things. Firstly, we always do this at the end, and every podcast does this at the end. But please go and rate the show on iTunes, guys, because it does help us. Uh, obviously, the whole BGN network, but obviously we're starting up a new thing here. So please mention us as well. And then secondly, Shane, I haven't even told you I'm going to do this, but we're going to play a little game uh, to begin the podcast because I've started writing scouting reports. And I'm starting to realize that I'm talking to American and I'm now worried that I'm using British slang in my uh, writing. So I'm going to ask you about two uh, things that I've said in the past week. And uh, I want you to tell me if they are acceptable for Americans to use as well. I okay. think the first one is. I don't think the second one is. You, you um, should know before you ask that I live in the South and we don't speak American. We speak our own little dialect, but that's OK. We'll go carry on. That's fair enough. I kid you not. So as many as many of you know, I teach and I spelt center wrong today in my lesson. Uh, like I'm writing stuff and kids are copying it down and they go, sir, that's not how you spell center. And I'm like, yeah, it is. And I realize I'm talking about it. See, in, in UK, we spell center with the RE, not the ER. So uh, it's it's not good. It's not yeah, good. That, that weird job. E that you guys put at the end of everything. I'm not going to lie. That's That's a little weird. Yeah. Anyway, so here you go. I think the first one is fine. So first one. Jack of all trades, master of none. Yeah, very common phrase. I use that. Yeah, all the that's time. what I thought. This one I reckon is not. Flat track bully. Never heard it. There you go. I threw flat track bully in my Reddit review this week. And as I'm typing it, I'm like, flat track bully. So basically, a uh, flat track bully is somebody who dominates smaller opposition. So a flat track bully is, I don't know really like how it comes from, but it's a sports person who dominates inferior opposition and can't beat like top level opponents so you may have guessed who i used it about uh hassan reddick because i think reddick is a li and it doesn't mean they're bad every every team needs a flat track bully every team needs a player that when you're playing the weaker opposition they put them away it's quite a english football term so you play that scores lots of goals and i used it in a analysis piece this week and i was typing it thinking does anybody know what a flat track bully is so there you go. Yeah. That's my uh, that's my two English phrases. We can, that was my lovely game at the start. Maybe I'm trying to think of what the English equivalent, the American equivalent would be. Um, See, maybe maybe we need to introduce flat track bully. Maybe, maybe everyone now listening in your daily conversation, flat track bully. We're going to launch it, and maybe every week. I mean, every week, no chance. Probably like every six months, I'll think of a phrase. But every so often, when I think of one, I'm never going to tell you. I'm just going to spring it on you randomly. It could be like week eight. Eagles have had a terrible, crushing defeat. We're going to begin the show with me just throwing in there a random uh, UK phrase because I actually shouldn't use that in scouting reports. So it's probably quite helpful to know. But now I'm tempted just to use it because now I'm like, well, maybe we should just start launching. Flat just have to bully. normalize it. We used to throw like old school draft scouting jargon into scouting reports and see if people would ask questions about it. Uh, and eventually you just learn it. But yeah, I, our, our listeners are probably screaming the phrase out right now because I know there is a, there is a descriptor that, conveys that same sentiment but i'm drawing a blank right now well i cannot help unfortunately so i'm going to go with flat track bully um i don't know where it comes from um I've absolutely no idea um but yeah there we go flat track bully if you think of the american tweet us if not start using flat track bully in your daily lives <laughs> there we go i love it uh we'll make that a part of the regular twitter discourse so okay so we last week uh went really far down the rabbit hole of Hassan Reddick and Josh Sweat and the contract implications. And I'm not going to run down the salary cap uh, in the way that I did last week. If you're not sure on what post June 1st and what all that stuff means, go check that out last week. I also tweeted out a link to a salary cap crash course video that I made last off season. That's about 11 minutes long. We're going to assume, you know, that stuff coming into this episode, uh, but we are going to continue to preview upcoming free agents or potential cap casualties. We're going to talk about uh, their cap hits, their stats from last year, and ultimately decide what we think we would do. We're not going to be showing film clips today uh, because we're going to try to move through these a little quickly. Um, so we'll see how that goes. It's not like you guys have never heard that before. So we're going to start off. Uh, we're going to stay in the trenches. We're going to talk about Fletcher Cox. So 
Uh, Fletcher Cox is not currently under contract for the Eagles right now, but the way his deal was structured does allow the Eagles to still use a post June 1st release this off season before all the dummy years void. So uh, they would have to sign him to a new contract, but they can also post June 1st release him, which is kind of a weird contract structure, but it's where we are. So if they just outright cut him right now, he would count 14.3 million in dead cap for 2024, which is obviously a massive number for a guy not playing on your team. If they post June one release him, it would be 4.2 million in dead cap this year. And that other 10.1 million would kick down the road to 2025. Obviously an extension would let the Eagles kick that can down the road if it was a long-term extension, uh, but you're probably not signing him to a long-term extension at, at this point in his career. So for the Eagles, the best cap option would be to re-sign a deal in that one year, six to seven million dollar range. Uh, however, that would be a pay cut from last year when he was paid 10 million, uh, but it would let him finish his year in Philadelphia and it lets the Eagles essentially only pay a couple million more than like the post June one release number and it would lower his dead cap in 2025. So in an ideal world, they would bring Fletcher Cox back, uh, letting him walk and then signing somebody else to that same contract would be significantly worse. Uh, also, if Fletcher Cox walks, you're probably drafting a pass rushing defensive tackle, not just signing one. Uh, so those are some of the considerations roster wise uh, for the Fletcher Cox thing. I will say I don't expect him to be back. I know there was a photo that went out. I think it was Zach Berman showing that Cox had completely cleaned out his locker uh, on clean out day, which is something that he's never done before. So I think Cox is anticipating going somewhere else next year, uh, but we'll see if that comes to fruition. So, because you're much better at cap stuff as people who are listening know, and I think that's probably quite good for the listeners because some people are probably, I mean, probably a lot of people are better than me, but so if they, re they're not going to release in pre-June, it's going to be post-June, guaranteed. Yep. Yes. And that means that let's say they, they owe him 4 million in dead cap anyway. So if they sign him to a seven year, 7 million one year deal, it's essentially a 3 million deal in a weird way because you're already paying him four anyway. So you're paying him four not to play for you or seven to play for you. Is that what you're saying? Correct. Yes. And then if you don't sign him and you sign another one, let's say you sign another defensive tackle for 7 million, you're now playing that other defensive tackle technically. 11 million because you're paying him seven plus you're playing cox four um is that also correct correct so if you think wow. of like fletcher cox's spot costs you 4.2 million already so if you paid fletcher cox uh you would have to pay fletcher cox 4.2 million more than whoever you would sign in free agency for it to be equivalent in terms of value in terms of what it would cost you in 2024 and then final thing, which I just forgot what I was going to say on this. Um, I forgot. I will remember in a second. Let's go to the stats and then it will come back to me because that's something that I, I think was useful. Uh, let's go to the stats. Um, if you are watching on YouTube, uh, we'll bring up the stats on the screen. If you're listening, we will talk through some of the main ones. Um, right. Take it over. Talk about what his major stats show from this year. I mean, I'll give you a quick little summary of just what I saw this year. Okay. And you can, if you're listening on audio platforms, you can go to my Twitter account at Shane half NFL, and you can use the little search icon and you can just type in whatever player you want, Fletcher Cox, 2023 stats, uh, and it will search this out for you. So uh, this is among 95 qualifying interior defensive linemen. And to qualify, they needed to play 350 snaps. All stats are from sports info solutions, uh, except for the PFF grades. So uh, he played 651 snaps, which ranked 24th in the NFL among defensive tackles. So a high volume player uh, at his age. Uh, he had five sacks, which ranked 22nd with a 1.2% sack rate that ranked 30th. Uh, he had 38 pressures, which ranked 17th in the NFL with a 9% pressure rate, which ranked 26th. Um, he had eight tackles for loss, which ranked 37th. His average depth of tackle was 1.9 yards past the line of scrimmage, which was 47th. Uh, if you want to look at PFF grades, he was the 19th highest graded interior defensive lineman. Uh, he was the 13th highest graded run defender and the 33rd highest ranked pass rusher. That's really interesting because it's different. Firstly, he actually ranks really well. Um, 
when you think for a man his age and you look at the numbers, ranking 19th overall in PFF grades, uh, ranking 22nd in sacks, you know, 17th in pressures. I sometimes find PFF really weird and I never take it as gospel. I don't think anyone does and anyone should. Um, this is just my personal opinion of Fletcher Cox this year. And I feel like the numbers sort of back me up as well. Um, he is basically becoming a pass rush special, uh, specialist. And I think that's pretty clear when you look at how the Eagles used him last year. Like he's rushing the quarterback a hell of a lot more than he's playing in run defense. I think that average tackle depth also suggests that he's not really penetrating the line of scrimmage in run defense. But ranking 17th in pressures for defensive tackle is good. The weird thing is they rank his run defense grade as better when his pass rush. No, actually, sorry, he ranks higher in run defense grade, but his pass rush grade is actually better. It's just that more people rank highly in pass rush based on PFF. Based on what you said about the numbers, I would bring him back. Um, I, if I did bring him back, though, um, I would bring him back basically to stop them having to waste money, not because I really am desperate to have him back. So I guess if you want to argue, um, you just take the hit. And this is what I was going to say earlier. This is when people talk about pushing the cap down the road. This is when it eventually catches up to you, isn't it? If you constantly push it back, eventually you'll have a year where it hits you. Maybe the Eagles just suck it up and this is the year. Um, I think the issue with Cox is actually going to be at his end. So I think the idea that he might leave is very true. I think cleaning the, the locker out is not a joke. I don't think he's taken a hometown discount. Cox has earned a lot of money in his career, like a huge amount. And I get the feeling he probably thinks he's got one more year he can cash in. And I think, and I might be wrong, that his pass rushing numbers are good enough. I bet a team still pays him like the eight to nine million range. And I think the Eagles might decide that actually that's not good enough. I think if they could get him for like six or seven, then it's a bit of a no-brainer because you're only paying him two or three million more. I bet he'll want eight to ten. Um, as a player this year, I think he played pretty well rushing the quarterback, but I think he has issues in run defense that come up every week, actually. I think he was a bit of a problem with the Eagles' poor run defense down the end of the um, season stretch in particular. So I think that I'd be happy to let him go. Obviously, Fletcher Cox is an Eagles legend. I think cat-wise, as you said, it makes sense to return. I get the feeling he won't be back because of him, not because of us. Yeah, I agree with that. I would like to see him back. At the same time, like he played better in 2023 than he did in 2022, in my opinion. And in 2022, he was able to get a $10 million a year deal. Now, he's obviously a year older. I think he's going to be looking in that 10 million range again. And I don't think the Eagles are going to want to pay that. Um, and so like, I think, like you said, the Eagles will want to bring Cox back. I just think he's simply going to hit the open market and get more than the Eagles will give him. Yeah, I would agree. I've got nothing really else revolutionary to say. So shall we move on to uh, everyone's favorite player, uh, Brandon Graham. And once again, I'm just sitting back and enjoying these kind of the shows because I just let Shane explain everything and then I just come in and say a little bit. So talk to me, Shane, about Brandon Graham's contract and then we'll look at um, some of the numbers that we looked at in the past. Yes, so uh, Brandon Graham is also not under contract. Just like Fletcher Cox, his contract also allows a po post-June 1 release, though, before the dummy year's void. Uh, if the Eagles release him pre-June 1st, he would hit the cap for $13.2 million in dead cap in 2024. Uh, if they post June 1 release him, it would be $6.4 million in 2024 and six point eight in 2025. Uh, I think the best option for Graham is also to re-sign him. He was on a one-year $5 million deal. It's worth mentioning he was coming off of his first ever double-digit sack season, and he did not hit those same numbers this year. Only three sacks. His playtime dropped uh, significantly. But if you can re-sign him to something in that ballpark, a one-year $5 million deal, uh, he can finish his career in Philadelphia. You actually save money versus doing doing a post-June 1. Like If you sign him to a one-year $5 million extension, you save $1.4 million this year, and he plays for you. Um, and I think, I mean, I think he wants to, he's, he said he wants to be in Philly. He said he wants to play one more year. I think they're going to get this done. Uh, however, what they do with Graham might be contingent on what they do with Reddick and Sweat. And we talked about those guys last week, but if both of them come back, you are four deep with Nolan Smith and Brandon Graham. Uh, and you can count on the Eagles drafting a pass rusher in the first first three picks they have in the draft, that first and two seconds. It's a good edge rusher class that 
our edge rusher rankings just posted to BGN radio uh, today. The Eagles are going to be in play for one of those guys. So I think it's one of those things where you're not going to see Reddick, Sweat, and Graham all on this roster. I just don't know exactly how it will shake out. Yeah, I think Graham's a really interesting one because obviously Eagles fans just absolutely love him, um, myself included. Uh, I think he will come back and I would bring him back. Um, the numbers, as you said, made sense. And I'm learning a lot here. So I'm guessing that means he's due 13 million. So if they cut him before, he gets it all at once. Whereas if it's a post June release, they separate it for two years. Um, this is another really good example, Shane, of the cat coming back to bite you. Because releasing him and paying him 6 million both years is not great. Um, so that uh, makes it harder to release him. Uh, I think he will be back. I don't think he's great anymore, but I think he's an extremely hard player, and meaning he gives everything on every snap. I don't think he can just simply play a great deal at this stage of his career. I think he's in the 15 to 20 ballpark range of snaps. Uh, I don't think he's great at the edge anymore, so I think he'd almost become like a, a part-time defensive tackle. I almost expect to see him as like a third down specialist as an interior. Um I think what's really interesting is we're we're stats guys and we're film guys, but I think culture is a really important thing to talk about with Graham. I think you look at the Eagles and you talk about the big like three or the big four, uh, and I don't really count Lane Johnson in this weirdly. I think Lane Johnson is one, but I think Lane's a bit more of a um, sort of behind the scenes figure. I think the big three have been Cox, Kelsey, and uh, Graham for years, and I think there's a good chance that they're going to lose two of them, and assuming Kelsey retires. And I think sometimes it's good to rip the band-aid off and just have a whole, new, let's have a whole new wave of culture. Let's have a new breed. Let's have Hertz, AJ Brown, uh, Jordan Mylata. Let's go for like a new a wave of leadership, which I think sometimes can help. But I get the feeling Brandon Graham is a bit different. I think he's one, like really one of the guys. And I think if you lose Kelsey and Cox, you maybe don't want to lose three of them. We already saw last year that when the culture sort of went at the end of the year, the whole season collapsed. And I think you can't underestimate the importance of keeping good players around that are good team players as well. So I think if you're trying to develop players like Nolan Smith, let's be honest, Brandon Graham was someone who struggled at the start of his career and then got better. Maybe Graham is a great person to have around uh, the team. Although being realistic, it makes it sound like I'm paying for a cheerleader here. Like it's not really what I'm saying. Uh, you don't just bring him back for that. I think it's the benefit of he can still play a little bit and he still plays extremely hard and he's a popular guy. Um, I expect he will be desperate to come back. So mm -hmm. I would expect him to sign a relatively uh, low um, cap number. Just have interest, Shane. So if he does sign, say, less than his post-June 1st release, how does that work? When you say we can save money, like why would he sign that then? So I'm asking a really stupid cap question here. Um, well, how does that work? The dead money is money he's already been paid from other yep. deals. So he doesn't right. lose that money. Uh, it's just once he's no longer on the roster, all of the that dead money accelerates onto the current year. So basically what you would do is say you go to Brandon Graham and say, hey, one year, five million, let's roll one more year. And he agrees to it. You're actually going to sign him to like a six year deal where the last five years are void years and it just kicks that can like that, that 12 point or $13.2 million, you're still going to pay it, but you can kick it down the road additional years for every year. He stays on the roster. And can you spread it out more as well then? So if you gave him a three year deal, could you push back? So rather than 6 million next year, you could have 2 million dead cap, 2 million, 2 million. Does that make sense? Can you spread out how you, how you do this? I guess. Sort of. Um, so if they, if you use a post June 1st release, you can, because the way that works is that current year dead cap is on that year and everything else accelerates to the following year. So like hypothetically say, you know, this $13 million, you could put 13 void years on a contract and then post June one him the next year and only have him 1 million of dead cap. But the next year it would be the full 12. Like it's just how you're going to allocate it across those two years. Right, I've got you, I've got you. There's actually, um, yeah, as people can tell, this is not, I'm not very good at cap stuff. Uh, and when I write, I never talk about cap stuff ever. I'm pretty much basically, this is what the film shows. Um, so it is interesting. There's actually similar discussions in the English football as well at the moment about how long contracts should be. I know this is not relevant to this, but I guess it is. That's why I'm mentioning it. Um, 
uh, there's like there used to be a team called Chelsea uh, who many football fans I know will know about and they were giving players like eight year contracts all the time and essentially just spreading the wages out on the transfer fee over a huge amount of years they could get away with spending loads and loads of money and the league has now bought in a rule where you can't have a contract more than five years essentially and it's the idea that it stops these huge contracts going out and then these players being tied to clubs for eight years which is mad when you think about it that's your whole career um, and you spread your spending across eight years which means you can spend a lot of money and actually it doesn't appear that much uh, when you look at it it's interesting it's very sports are similar um yeah. before we move on look at the stats i think you've got some for graham haven't you as well um, yeah i imagine they're not going to show a great picture realistically but let's have a look anyway yeah one thing i think is interesting is his pressure percentage was actually higher than both reddick and sweat now obviously he played a lot less snaps but his 12.9 percent pressure rate ranked above Reddick's 12.6 and Josh Sweat's uh, 12%. Uh, he also drew four holding penalties. And we sort of talked about last week that a holding penalty presumably is a sack. Like it's, I beat my guy and they held me. Now, not always. It can be on a run play too, but it, it's roughly equivalent to a sack. It moves the offense 10 yards backwards. It doesn't cost them a down, but still like the EPA impact is, is pretty significant. So uh, he drew some holds. His pressure rate was better than those guys. Um, his sack percentage was 1.5%, which is slightly above Sweat's 1.3. That's uh, below Reddick's 2.2. So, uh, And again, he's got a lot smaller sample size than either of these guys because he did play significantly less snaps. Um, but yeah, it's a guy that they put him at defensive tackle, like you mentioned, a decent amount. They've tried to run like some pass rush games around him being at defensive tackle and uh, if he is back, I would expect it to be similar usage again in 2024. Yeah, I think that's where his uh, talent lies now. The pressure rate is pretty cool, isn't it, to see um, in comparison. Also not great for the other two. Um, but I think, as you mentioned, some of that is playing on third down, obvious pass rushing situations. You can pin your ears back and go after the quarterback and not have to worry so much about run discipline. I think that's essentially where I would look for Reddick to be in the future. He can play a little bit on early down if you're trying to stop the run against a certain team as well, because he's still a big guy and he's still a hard guy to move off his spot. Um, he's not going to get caught upfield as easily as maybe Sweat or Nolan Smith are, for example. Um, but I think he will come back and I think he should because he's an Eagles legend. And I think I'm not sure my heart can take losing Brendan Graham and Jason Kelsey in one off season. Uh, should we get to everyone's favorite position in the world next, Shane? And I actually noticed that Harry Roseman uh, was a bit sarcastic with reporters today when asked, or today, whenever he was in, whenever he was spoken to, uh, about this position. So let's talk linebacker. Who do you want to do first? Let's do Cunningham. Um, so uh, Zach Cunningham is on an expired contract. It has no void years. He can walk. It costs the Eagles nothing. Uh, so there's no dead cap associated with him. He played last year on a one-year, $1.7 million deal. Um, and so here's his stats from a year ago. Um, these are, again, from SIS, minimum 500 snaps with 100 coverage snaps. So I could parse out, like, you know, just the pure... Because, like, for example, in, in Sports Info Solutions, Hassan Reddick is listed as a linebacker, but he's strictly a pass rusher. Uh, he doesn't have 100 coverage snaps. So 69 qualifying linebackers who played at least 500 snaps with at least 100 coverage snaps. Uh, Zach Cunningham played 677 total snaps. Uh, he was in the coverage, take coverage stats for what they're worth, which honestly is not much because charting services don't know. Uh, in fact, I know for a fact I found plays that were charted incorrectly on whose responsibility they were just because watching film and understanding the scheme a little bit better than a guy that, an intern that's having to chart every snap of every game for different teams. So, but for what it's worth, uh, he had two passes defensed, which ranked 25th. Uh, he allowed a completion percentage of 56.7%, which was 10th, um, 10th best. That is like first would be best. Uh, his deserved catch percentage, which basically removes drops. It removes uh, deflections, removes, you know, that sort of is 86.4%, which was 34th. Uh, he allowed a passer rating of 54.6, uh, which was eighth, and he allowed 0.3 yards per coverage snap, which was 10th. His EPA per target was negative 0.390, which was eighth. That makes it sound like he's a really good pass rusher or a really good uh, coverage guy. Uh, PFF has him a 67.9 coverage grade, which is 23rd. Eagles fans will know 
Johnny and I would not say that Cunningham was that good in coverage, but that's what the charting services showed. At least if you look at his tackle stats, he racked up 85 tackles, which was 53rd. Uh, his average tackle depth was 1.7 yards, which was ninth. And his broken tackle must plus missed tackle percentage was 8.6%, which ranked 21st. So uh, in Zach Cunningham, you have a guy who, regardless of what it says, was not the best cover guy, uh, but he was good in run defense, I thought. And he was a, he was a solid tackler. Right, so I'm going to say something radical here, Shane. I think one of Moro or Cunningham maybe should come back. Um, I don't really know who. I don't really care who. I don't want any of them to play a great deal, but I feel like maybe for just depth. Um, I could not care less what the stats say on this one. Apologies to the stat man. Cunningham is horrendous in coverage. Mm -hmm. like, I think he's as bad as a linebacker in coverage as I've seen in a long time. But I'm going to defend him. I'm going to defend him for a second. I think he was an exceptionally good run defender early on in the season. I think he had a knee injury or whatever he had injury-wise. I think it was knee. And when he came back, he was absolutely not the same player. So I think a healthy Zach Cunningham is actually not a horrendous player. And it's quite interesting that both of them have um, the PFF grade around like the early 30s. It's not terrible. And I, I know grades, take them as they will. They're basically like the same person. He's 29 years old. He's probably got like a year or two left. He can play the run. I'm going to defend both of Cunningham and Rowe here as well, Shane. I think the way the Eagles used them was abysmal last year. I think defensive coaches deserve as much blame. Like Cunningham sucks in coverage. And I, I mean, he truly does suck. So why on earth are you sticking him in like third and 10, third and 12, third and 14 situations? They were blitzing him from deep when the guy's got no acceleration to blitz. Like, I think if you use Cunningham in basically a bang average way, you essentially stick him in the middle of the field on early downs. You never, ever, ever play him on late passing downs ever. And you maybe play him against run heavy teams. He can do a job for you. He is not a total joke. Uh, he is not Shaq Leonard. Sorry, I had to throw it in there. Like he can play a bit. Um, I know you're going to get into Morrow's contracts after this, but seeing as you've got Morrow's stats up on the uh, screen, to be honest, the contract's nothing for either of them, isn't it? They're both like paid minimum. Yeah. If you get either of them back, it doesn't matter. It's going to cost you like a million back. Um, Nicholas Moreau, I think, is a little bit of a better player. I think he genuinely played quite well at points last year. I think he can actually rush the quarterback a little bit more from depth. Um, he's not as consistent as a tackler, but I think he's better in coverage. Um, I don't think he's good in coverage either. I think they're very, very similar, actually. Moreau just has a few more, like, splash plays where he came downfield in run defense, and you were like, wow. Um I think the problem is everyone has got such a bitter taste in their mouth about Moreau and Cunningham because basically the season ended so badly and those two were so bad. But I think a lot of that was to do with how they were used, not just that they are terrible players. I watched Moreau quite a lot um, at the Bears and he was like an okay player. Like he wasn't great. He wasn't good. Then the Eagles ran to be like, cut him. He didn't make the team, did he? And everyone was a bit like, oh. And then they started playing him again. And I was like, uh, he's good. Like, I think he's fine. So I was a little bit confused by how they used him last year. Um, but I think one of them might come back. I'm not sure if they will, but I feel like they're both acceptable, passable players. They're not like horrendous. I think they were made to look horrendous because they were used in such a bad way last year. Yeah, I would. If I was going to bring one of them back, I think I would bring Cunningham back instead of Moreau. Um, however, I, I would bring both of them back at their same contract from last year. It was 1.2 million for Moreau, 1.7 for Cunningham, simply because the Eagles have nothing at linebacker. Uh, I mean, you've got Nicobe Dean who can't stay healthy, and that's really it. Ben Van Sumeren, I think, is the only other linebacker, if I'm remembering correctly, that is under contract for next year. And as much as, you know, I hope the Eagles draft a linebacker, linebacker ranking show will drop on the BGN feed next week. By the way, uh, we just recorded that last night. As much as I would love for the Eagles to draft one of those guys, and maybe they finally will, um, you cannot walk into the draft with Nicobe Dean and Ben Van Sumeren as your only two linebackers. I mean, the Eagles ran out of linebackers this year, and it was a major problem. 
I would I would bring either I would bring both of these guys or either of them back at their same contracts from last year. I would still look to sign another vet in free agency and look to make a draft pick uh, because, I mean, you should be carrying five or six linebackers into the regular season in, in an ideal world. And I don't think either of these guys were good. I don't think either of them are like prohibitively bad to keeping on your roster. I would not want them both or either to start, but they're nice contingency plans. Well, there you go. I thought I was being radical saying the Eagles should bring one of them back. And then you go and bring out the, I'll bring both of them back, which uh, not is to not start. what I was expecting. Not to start. Yeah, I will I say. agree. I agree. I, I cannot watch Shaq Leonard ever again or a player like that. Um, I think Ben Van Sumeren, um has got something about him and that might be a fun off season guy to go back and watch, maybe go back and watch his college uh, tape a little bit more, depending on if it looks like he's going to play. Cause I think he's got just a freak athletic profile. Um, but Dean's never healthy. Uh, ben Van Center, as you mentioned, is a UDFA. You can't go into the draft and just draft an early linebacker and expect him to fix your problems. And let's be honest, are the Eagles going to go and splash out huge at linebacker? Maybe one. But when Dean's injured, you could need other guys as well. I think Moreau's like quite a good like backup to Dean, more of like a wheel build um, rather than like your generic Mike. He's quick. He's undersized. I think he can play like the Kobe Dean like backup role. And then Cunningham's maybe more of your traditional uh, like side to side linebacker, run defense, early downs. Um, I don't hate, there was moments, Shane, if I'm being honest, we don't lie here. You can view the tweets, you've read the articles. Um, I had moments this year when I like both of them. There were moments when I really like Moreau. I mean, there was moments when Cunningham grew on me. I maintained all year that Cunningham was horrendous in coverage. So I've I, I've not thought, I've not like wavered on that. But I think both of them are okay as long as you don't ask them to blitz from like 15 yards deep. And as long as you're not playing both of them on third and 12 and asking one of them to cover wide receivers, which is what the Eagles liked to do uh, last year. So there you go. I was expecting us to agree on that. But maybe whether any of them would actually come back is another story. I don't know how much they enjoyed playing for the Eagles last year. Let's, let's find out. But I would guess there might be a chance that they may both return, which is not what I expect you to say. So there you go. Yeah, I would be totally fine with it as long as... That's not the Eagles saying we're fine at linebacker uh, because I would be very out on that. I don't want either of them to start. But again, yeah, you do not want to be competing with the Cowboys to see who gets the right to sign Shaq Leonard in week 15 next year. Uh, please, for the love of football watchability, just have competency in your backup linebacker positions. And, and that's what they represent. Like, I don't think they're I don't think they're guys you want to start, but they're competent and, and they could play a role for you. Yeah, I can't do that again. I'm sorry. I feel really mean picking on one player, but it was it was horrendous. Uh, it was like as bad as it gets. Um, right. I think that's me done. We've actually chain managed to be quite quick for once. Like I'm I'm, I'm impressed. It turns out maybe talking for Nicholas Moreau and Zach Cunningham for an hour is not what people want to hear. So yeah. we're trying to be a little bit shorter and snappier in the off season as well. Especially because we're going to get the fun stuff later. Like wait till free agency, wait till draft uh, profiles. That would be the really good stuff. Have you got anything final to add on the players we have discussed today? No, just people are going to be really confused when the, this episode drops and it's 33 minutes long. They're going to assume that like the whole episode didn't get uploaded uh, or it's going to be someone that's like, man, they had a long outside project to do this weekend. They really just wanted to listen to on the Shane page and they were counting on us and maybe we let them down. And if that's so, uh, you know, we apologize, but you didn't really want to listen to us for an hour on, Nicholas Morrow and Zach Cunningham. Yeah, like if that's true, fair play, but also get some hobbies. It's the 28th of Feb. There's so many things to do for an hour. Not that I'm moaning about your listening trust for an hour, but come on. Uh, yeah, and plus we are doing that. We are in draft season mode. So I'm getting off this at God 8 and I'm sitting down and watching draft prospects for my evening as well. Uh, so this is what we do. This is like part of the daily grind of a uh, draft season but it is the best bit i love free agency it's probably one of my favorite parts of the off season as well so uh, we'll save the longer episodes when the eagles have some really fun players to talk about uh not for cutting them and moreau yeah well now that johnny has insulted our listeners and told them to stop listening to us and go get a hobby yeah that went well didn't it well i guess we'll get out of here uh and hope that you guys come back next week Uh, i really appreciate you i'm glad this is your hobby uh don't listen to johnny uh just you know, give those five star ratings and reviews. You can call Johnny out in those reviews and say, this is my hobby. That's totally fine. Uh, but we will catch you guys next week. Uh, we're, next week, we're going to finish breaking down 
these pending free agents and potential cap casualties. We're going to talk uh, Kevin Byard, James Bradbury, DeAndre Swift, uh, Avante Maddox next week. So be sure you tune back in for that. And then we'll be into free agency podcast. So we will catch you guys next week for another episode of On the Shane Page.